Hi, I'm Kelvin Harrison Jr. from the High Note, and you're listening to Quan Chi Ping. This is ContraZoom, where we go back and forth about films. I'm your host, Dakota Arsenault, and today's episode is presented by Aesthetic Magazine. On today's show, we have an interview with Kelvin Harrison Jr., star of the new film, The High Note. I grew up around music. It's my whole world. If you told 12-year-old me that one day I'd be working for Grace Davis, she's an icon. This woman doesn't even know your last name. She does, sometimes. Ah! Great. Do it again. Damn, the girl still give me goosebumps. Well, Grace, have you thought any more about the Vegas residency? Actually, I think it's time I record a new album. I mean, that's one plan. Today, I am joined with Kelvin Harrison Jr., star of movies like Waves, It Comes at Night, and The Photograph, whose latest film is The High Note, directed by Nisha Ganatra. Welcome, Kelvin. How are we doing today? I'm good. I'm good. I'm just sitting here in my blanket on the couch, all cozy, and uh, it's a good day. <laughs> that sounds like a great way to do some press. Yes, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, let's talk about your new movie, The High Note. Our introduction to your character, David, is singing the theme song to the OC and then proceeding to live out every music nerd's fantasy by bantering back and forth debating music as a means to flirt with the beautiful women. Uh, how much fun was it to shoot that scene? Oh, I mean, I, just, I was just, you know, auditioned with, so it was just, like, fun to get in there and actually see the grocery store and be there with Dakota and, like, um, <clears throat> and just, like, be in the outfit. And I think that scene really encaptures, like, who David is um, in terms of his, his uh, how, you know, where, he, where what he's, his taste level is and what he's interested in, how he decides to talk about, you know, music, how he decides to have that dialogue with her the, the subtext of that scene is so rich as well in terms of just like you know trying to understand how people what the role music plays in someone's life and also their, their relationship to artists and um and, and um and and, and and lyrics and sound and how that influences the perspective on um how people behave and i think that was really interesting with that scene but it was fun it was just fun to kind of to kind of just, just play around and see where it goes and it also ends with like a terrific punchline about Sam Cooke, which is which is really fun to watch. You play a promising musician in the movie. What's the process like of having to perform as your character in a studio when you aren't actually on set? Mm. I think uh, it's you know it's very scary. The love, the good thing about um, the process was <clears throat> it felt like what David would have been going through because in the movie. You know, though he's made some tracks, I've also made some tracks with some buddies, you know, and but it wasn't like legit, you know, um, to to step into a studio in that way with, you know, Dark Child, the Rodney Jerkins, our producer of the movie, was intimidating. <laughs> and um, I just I think it um, I, I found myself very nervous and feeling like very inadequate at moments within learning my stride and learning like what I had to offer it, you know, it's storytelling at the end of the day and personalizing the, these words. And, um, I think that is also what David was is learning in the movie with Maggie. And so it became very meta in a lot of ways. And I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of got to just use some of my life experiences too, um, and, and bring them back to the character. So. There's a scene of you in the recording studio and due to your character's nerves, you sort of struggle with getting your timing down. It actually reminds me a little bit of the the not my tempo bit from Whiplash in the sense of you as an actor need to purposely mess up on camera to get what the story requires from you. Was that a challenge? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was. Um, cause at first I started off, I was like, is there a subtler way to um, establish the fact that he, um, <laughs> he's nervous? and the general consensus was, well, make it obvious. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. Um, 
it, it, it's tricky only because you don't want her to seem so. I don't know. I don't really know how it comes across because I know what actually happened. So I think I look at it for what it is. But he was trying to make it not feel so like like it was a joke, like he was doing it intentionally. But it should hopefully it would feel it'll still coming from this place of nerve nerves. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I because I play music, I, I'm just like getting getting time, my guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I, I know better than that. So. Um, it was frustrating to do that, but I do love the the reference to the whiplash. That's really cool. Um, <laughs> not my temple. That's such a great scene. Oh my god, I watched that movie today. I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll I'll just say as a viewer, it kind of took me. I think about till the second or third take of uh, of David singing that I clued into why you were being stopped and asking to restart. So I think you did play off the scene the right way. Uh, thanks. We also get to see the working relationship between, you know, writers and producers, mixers, session players. How does this film version of events compare to the reality of being in a studio? Ooh, I mean, it's, it's a, I think what, you know, what I really loved about the scene of track eight was the fact that Nisha did do this, like, um, montage of all the different stuff that kind of go into place. I mean, it would, it could happen in the night. I've seen Rodney turn around a, a track overnight. And that's because he's a professional and, and, and the, you know, icon he is. Um, and, and so, but it was cool seeing, you know, Maggie put the beats in and do the mixing and, um, um, you know, just do all the different stuff, all the different stuff, the mastering and, uh, you know, adding the, the background vocals and moments and the guitar parts. Uh, you know, it is a process. So I do think the movie did a good job of showing, like, to me, what I saw from, our experience of actually making some of these songs and they would actually move sometimes faster. So, um, it's a step by step process. And and Dakota was very well versed on all of the equipment she was using for the most part. And it was just impressive to see her know what she was doing. So the, the, these, um, these, 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 uh, mixing boards would be live. And so she would kind of get in there and, and hopefully, um, mimic and also some of the, um, assistants from our actual studio time would come in and work with her as well. And just to make sure there was some accuracy. So, um, I, I feel like we did a good job at keeping it pretty, pretty spot on. That's cool. Uh, did you use music as a way to get into your character's headspace? And if so, can you maybe share some of the selections? Ooh, what did I listen to? I had a playlist at one point. Let me see if I can pull it up. Um, <clears throat> I definitely, I was going for a, a, um, I was looking at guys that, I found interesting of the moment that were African American that, you know, had shared maybe some similar tastes that I, I had because I was also trying to make sure that whatever my voice was, I could support that in terms of the choice of what David would become. Um, cause I didn't want to go too far outside of what I, what I could actually do. Otherwise it was just a stretch. Um, so I, I looked to Daniel Caesar. I thought he was very interesting. Um, youthful, you know, he grew up in the church and that was, I listened to his ass case, case, um, case like eight or something like case one, case or one or something like that, his album. And, um, Anderson Pack, I listened to a lot. Um, Leon Bridges, I love, uh, Gary Clark Jr., I love, um, the style and also just stage presence and just, um, more so in his charisma. Anderson Pack was similar, similarly more his charisma. Um, Obviously, we had some Donny Hathaway on, on my little playlist that I listen to every day. Uh, I also, Otis Redding, I had a lot of that I listened to. Um, yeah, so it's just, it, those are a couple of the artists and, uh, I don't, I don't have the playlist anymore, but, and then I also had listened to a lot of, um, I listened to a lot of Whitney. Um, and tracking because I was trying to figure out a, a, a good comparison to, you know, what listening to Grace Davis might have been like and what type of music would have been, you know, ingrained in me and how that would have manifested itself in, in my work and it would be David's work. Um, and also in terms of just the, the story and the narrative of where the emotional life and connection is coming to from where the songs are going. Um, and trying to apply that even within the covers of You Send Me and let's stay together and um, so forth and so forth, you know? Those are some great <clears throat> selections. Um, throughout your career, you've been in some 
pretty serious films like Waves, It Comes at Night, and Loose. What's the difference in being in intense films like that compared to something more lighter in tone like The High Note? It's just such a relief. I mean, I found <laughs> I found this movie very um, therapeutic in a lot of ways. It still was challenging, um, mostly because the, the I'm not, I guess I'm not accustomed to keeping it as light. Um, but at the same time, I still wanted to make sure he had a, um, a beating heart that felt real and authentic and human. So that aspect of it is challenging. But in terms of um, the, you know, when you look at loose and waves, it's, it's, it's way more um, technical and uh, exhausting physically and mentally and emotionally on me. So, this was, it was fun. It was lighthearted. It was upbeat. You know, I, I don't remember a day where I was just like, just sad all day. You know, I was always just like, it was just constant laughter and just trying to figure out, um, an enjoyment of, of being present in the moment with Dakota. And, you know, that feeling of when you get butterflies and when someone brings you joy and someone, you know, someone also speaks the same language as you. It was just, that's what it, you know, when you're playing these roles, it feels, it feels, um, euphoric at times and that that's always that's always that's a good that's a good chemical feeling that's going on in your body it's healthy you know <laughs> is there a bit of a difference of being on set uh like do other people sort of treat the the lightness or the darkness differently um um in the differences of the projects or just this specific one in the differences between the projects uh, i mean yeah everyone's different you know some people I personally, I really, when I'm taking on a role, I, I really, it's not that I'm like method or anything, but I truly, am, I feel like I embody the spirit of the, the tone of the movie and it just fits with me. So I feel everything. And if the general vibe is good and, and happy and upbeat, then that's what I'm feeling. If the general vibe is very stressful and very daunting and, and heavy, and um, then I kind of take on that as well. And I think other people handle it different. I remember working with Sterling K. Brown on Waves and he not once ever felt like he was taking on that world with him as soon as we said cut. It was, he was making jokes, he was lighthearted, and he was going back and forth between this and us and our movie. And so he just stayed very, um, you know, level-headed about it all. And I was the sad boy on set every day. <laughs> but, um, you know, everyone works differently, and I'm still learning how to get to that level. I think he has a level of expertise that. I, I aspire to have one day, and I think that's why he can do that. Same with Tracy, same with you know Octavia, and Naomi, and Tim. You know, they're they've, they've done this for a long time. So one day, one day I'll be able to walk away and be good. <laughs> <laughs> Having recently seen Waves, I'm I'm kind of glad that knowing that Sterling K. Brown wasn't that intense off screen as he was on screen. Then, yeah, he's wonderful. He's so sweet, so funny too. He's just he's honestly goofy. I was talking to him the other day and he was making fun of my hair and I was like, you're back at it, huh, Brown? <laughs> <laughs> this film is surrounded by some terrific female talent from its stars, Tracy Ellis Ross and Dakota Johnson to the director, Nisha Ganatra and writer, Flora Greeson. What was the being on set, being surrounded by all these powerful women like? Oh, it's just, honestly, that was um, very comforting and um, inspiring to kind of see how they how they work together and see what they came up with to to really create this world around this this, this artist, Grace Davis, and this woman to make her full, to make her complex, to make her, you know, independent and strong, but also vulnerable in moments. She's she's a full person and I feel like we see that in the movie. And so to see that happen to the support and the camaraderie and the jokes and the love that they showed each other was was, was um it, it was another moment you know being a person of color in the industry or a person of culture in the industry I definitely look you know it's nice to see other people that are minorities you know you know Nisha Nisha being a person of color Tracy Dakota being a woman come together to and Flora Greeson to tell the story in the way they did felt like another step forward to be able to be an African American male in that space as well to play like a romantic interest was exciting as well to serve that narrative was um it was different and um and the movie can still be entertaining and good and my buddies watched it too and it was like i love the high note and i was like i love when my buddies love the high note you know what i mean <laughs> i was like that's cool so it's like it, you know we can it's, it's something for everybody there are no there are no rules and regulations and restrictions on on storytelling um and i think that's what that that collaborative experience taught us and i think we will get to see more of that you know that's awesome. 
Um, this movie was originally supposed to be released on May 8th, but due to COVID-19 and the theaters being closed and said was released in drive-ins and video on demand, how has real life circumstances impacted the way people are viewing and receiving the film? Mm. I, I have no idea what, like how, who's watching, who's not watching. It, it was, it's, you know, it was actually really difficult because the movie came out amidst um, the death of George Floyd. And so we, it was a, it was a really challenging time. It, you know, I felt like for most of us, we didn't feel um, the movie. Um, we didn't really want to talk about the movie as much. There were more important, pressing topics, to, you know, to kind of tackle. And um, I don't really, I don't really know if anyone got to really see the movie or or what what that did for it. Um, and in this, and also with the pandemic going on. Um, but I do think it has potential to get, you know, a second wave and people can watch it and see what that experience is like. But from what I heard, if you did get to watch it at home, then they really enjoyed it. And it was a, a little bit of light in a very untrying and challenging time for a lot of us. Um, and that, that makes me really happy, um, to know that we could, we could spark some joy, um, and some levity. And, uh, that is also still a movie that is, um, it's a celebration of a lot of things, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, that's good to hear. Uh, with the world on lockdown and productions having been shut down everywhere, I'm interested to kind of know how you've been spending your time. Are you using it to get some rest or have you been using this time to pursue some other passions? Oh, man, I just, I've been so grateful for it. And, and it's strangely enough, it's been like a blessing in disguise. Cause you know, we, I was ripping and running, you know, from, press thing the press thing go out to start a job and you know i wasn't even ready to start the job in all honesty i was very tired <laughs> so this has been good because i've been able to rest and you know you know talk to my parents more and talk to my sisters more and build up those relationships and um connect with my friends and see you know things that i didn't know that were going on with them that i finally got to you know talk about and address some of my own things and read more i've been reading a lot of books you know i've started to figure out that i can option novels now and these are options for storytelling um developing all the things that i wanted to do but didn't have enough time to really think about in the moment and to really sell in and also appreciate and celebrate the moments that i did have i think you know oftentimes it's so easy for us to just go 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 and we don't get to really take in what we have in front of us and so that has been really beautiful in that way um and I'm working out and I'm cooking like everybody else. I can start a cooking show maybe too. <laughs> thinking about that. <laughs> That's awesome. But my cooking's not that great. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a signature dish yet? Um, I've perfected the gumbo, the New Orleans Ooh. gumbo. That's where I'm from. And uh, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm bringing New Orleans to LA and uh, I hope they're ready for it. <laughs> Man, I went on my, my honeymoon to New Orleans mostly because of the food. So if you're bringing the gumbo to L.A., I think mm-hmm. that's all for the best. Hey, that's amazing. <laughs> it has been a pleasure getting the chance to talk with you. So thank you so much. You as well, man. You as well. I know everyone is happy with me doing the same show every night. What if there's something more? Grace, I didn't want to tell you or Jack, but I did a cut of your song. Hey, hey, I can hear y'all. Y'all know it's a damn microphone in there, right? I want to thank Kelvin Harrison Jr. for coming on the show and to Think Jam for setting the interview up. The High Note is currently available to rent or own on most video-on-demand platforms and is available to purchase on Blu-ray and DVD on August 11th. Before we go, I'd like to plug my appearance on Hawkeyes, an Ethan Hawke-themed podcast. I was a guest on episode 52, Out Now, as I discussed the 2014 Shakespearean adaptation Cymbeline with host Harper Thompson and Jonathan Zavaleta. It was a ton of fun being on that show, so make sure you check out the show notes and my Instagram link tree for where to find it. ContraZoom is presented by Aesthetic Magazine. I'd like to thank Eric and Kevin Smale for the theme music and Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. Follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at ContraZoomPod. What have been some of your favorite 2020 movie releases so far? Send us an email at contrazoompod at gmail.com. It will be a great help if you would rate and review the show wherever you listen to podcasts as it will help us grow and find new listeners. Thank you for listening.